very happy to be here and um, yeah, welcome to my talk. Uh, before I share uh, some knowledge with you, um, which is obviously the, the basis of a talk, I want to share an experience with you. And for this, you need uh, both of your hands. If you don't have uh, two hands because of an accident or something, it doesn't work for you, I'm sorry. But for the rest of you, um, if you have your hands, just hold them in front of you and just do as I do. Like uh, I want you to put your hands together and fold them like this, like everything is connected. And then I want you to pick them apart again. And I want to do this a second time. So I'm folding them again. Everything like also my thumbs are down. And I'm taking them apart again. And I'm folding them again. And now I want you to tell me which of your thumbs is the upper one. Is it the one from your left hand or the one from your right hand? You can write it maybe in the Slack channel. Um, it's not really important if it's your right, right or left thumb. What you need to do next is basically you need to remember which thumb was the upper one. And now you take your hands apart again. And now please put your hands together, but this time put the other thumb on top. Okay. Did you do that? And how does that feel? Or how does it make, it you, make you feel? Well, I can tell you that for me it feels a bit weird. It feels a bit unusual, let's put it this way. And it's basically, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay, but I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, you know, need, I wouldn't have done it this way if I wouldn't have been asked to do it this way. And this brings me to my talk, which is about our first steps with the Beam Python SDK, where I um, basically was also having this experience, basically, sometimes that I had to switch from Java to Python. And then I had this experience of, hmm, this feels a bit weird now doing it this way. And then after some time, it felt more and more natural. But I will come to that. So at Ricardo, um, we have the Beam Java SDK in production since almost or over three years. Um, but everything in our data intelligence team uh, that the data science or machine learning people do uh, is written in Python. So there's this gap of, okay, uh, do we want to operationalize this very largely? Hmm, we might need to rewrite this in Java, or maybe we need to encapsulate it. It would be nice if we could all do it in Python instead of um, you know, having, having mixed codes. Of course, it's also possible in Beam, as we know, but for us, it was easier also to explain to the data scientists if there was just one file. If you don't know Ricardo, um, Ricardo is an online auctioning site based in Switzerland. And it's for secondhand and new articles, basically. And it's in the game for over 20 years. Um, so it's quite uh, a mature company, you could say. Um, and it has seen a lot of technologies come and go. But uh, since I joined the data intelligence team um, over three years ago, um, Beam was introduced. And uh, it looks like it's here to stay. For um, Ricardo, the important part is that the data intelligence team at Ricardo has uh, the complete ownership also about everything. So when we launch pipelines, we also maintain them and we also need to look at the operations. So we are always interested in finding ways to reduce the operations and um, put things um, yeah, in other hands that we can trust or rely upon. Um, we have a Apache Flink cluster that is actually executing all our uh, Java pipelines right now. Uh, we have a Kafka source, and uh, that was from my previous talk. So if you're interested about that setup, I can recommend you to look at the previous Beam Summit talks. But today, I have the following question for you. My question is about the Olsen twins. So if you don't know the Olsen twins, um, they are basically um, Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. They have been uh, in the TV series Full House when they were young. Um, and there has been a conspiracy post by um, John Oliver in his late night uh, show last week tonight, uh, I think in 2017, uh, which was the conspiracy that they are not basically um, two per people, 
but one person moving back and forth very quickly and confusing your eye. So uh, what we're going to do today is we want to find out if they are the same person or they are just sharing the same computer to log in into Ricardo. Uh, why? Because sometimes on Ricardo we have people um, who forget that they have already registered as we are 20 years old. And then they maybe have changed their email address. So they also register just with the, um, with the same name and a new email address because they completely forgot about their account. Or maybe they misspell their street name. They put a misspelling in the street name and then it doesn't really match their old account. Um, and sometimes you also have family members sharing a computer or device. And uh, it's interesting to see if they, have, uh, if they are in the same house especially uh, if you have uh, fraud cases and you need to investigate if, if something has been, uh, you know, many accounts have logged in onto the same device or not. So to answer this question, we have the following data sources available. So our production data, as I said, comes from Apache Kafka um, that's being fed into BigQuery by a, a Flink cluster running Apache Beam pipelines. And we also have Google Analytics data that goes into our BigQuery um, data sets. And we use BigQuery as our main data warehouse at Ricardo to store all information in one place and analyze it. And Google Analytics uh, can help you to identify if two accounts share the same session ID. So uh, then you can know if a user has logged out and logged in with two different accounts on, on, on the same device. So naively, Given that this is available, we could just simply use SQL in BigQuery and some regexes and do duplicate matching because you could say, well, I allow this amount of you know, free um, within these street names, for example, a freedom of uh, you know, the different characters between street names. But um, then to find out which uh, account is linked to another. So basically, same name, same street, should be the same person. The problem is, as you might know or not know, but I'm telling you now, Switzerland is a multi-language country. So let's say the Olsen twins live in Switzerland. Um, then the regex approach becomes quite complex very fast. So you can see here on the left side, uh, Swiss military chocolate. I wasn't aware that this is the thing until I prepared this talk, but it is a thing, basically, that there's military chocolate. Um, and you can see all four languages here on the, um, on the chocolate. And the official languages in Switzerland are German, French, Italian, and uh, Romansch, which is a yeah, non, not so often found language, but it's in Graubünden. And all of these languages come with their own punctuation marks and special umlauts. So you can see here on the right a uh, um, street sign in Biel. Uh, the upper part is Quellgasse, German. And the downer part is Rue de la Source, uh, which is French. So I am, um... okay, okay, it goes on, sorry. So um, now let's say we want to um, make sure that we are matching all different typos of Quellgasse. Um, we could basically just look at how many uh, different cases of Quellgasse we have. <laughs> and uh, just uh, then using fuzzy string matching, so um, basically, you can see here that this is not really, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, performant because the problem is that it becomes very complex, very fast if you have a lot of street names and you need to compare a repository of street names. So basically, you could um, get away with saying, OK, I don't need to compare the same street with the same street name, but it's still n times n minus 1. So the only optimization here is to leave out the one that you already uh, the one do not compare the street with itself, but uh, you or we basically judged this to be not very efficient. Um, so I was like, okay, but I need to parallelize it. Um, I need to make it more efficient. And also I want to use the power of beam basically so that I somehow need a map, a mapping function to basically make this uh, run faster. And then I went down the rabbit hole uh, for me at least, and I found phonetic algorithms, um, which I wasn't aware of. And the phonetic algorithms uh, index words by their pronunciation. Um, Soundex is one of the most known, but this is only suitable for English. And uh, this didn't really work with German. 
at all for me. And what I needed was one that worked uh, for the four languages that I used in Switzerland. So German, um, Greater Romanian, or Romansh, um, Italian, and French. So I dig deeper and I found uh, Cologne phonetics or the Kölner phonetic. Uh, that assigns a, a, sequence, or a sequence of digits um, to words, so a so-called phonetic code. And this was published in 1969. So then that was the first uh, reaction of myself, like 1969, how, how did that work and why was it invented? So I dig deeper and I found out that uh, the Cologne phonetics uh, were invented in 1969 by Hans-Joachim Postel. And Hans-Joachim Postel was an employee of the German intelligence service because these people need to basically, you know, put people in different um, cabinets. And Hans-Joachim traveled to the U.S. in 1970 to see mainframes in action. And uh, at that moment, I knew, okay, if this thing worked back then efficiently, then it would also run on a calculator nowadays with the processing power. So um, I only had to check if it works well with French and Italian. And uh, in fact, it did. So uh, here I have an example. So we have these three writings of um, Quellgasse. Uh, Quellgasse on the very left is the correct uh, pronunciation. Quellgasse is a typo and Quellgasse... The Quellgasse on the down right is also a typo. But all of those, because of the pronunciation, uh, are all assigned the number 458. So uh, now we have found our map function to tackle the data set with Beam, because now we can basically break down this problem and say, OK, um, let's map things together and um, make it fly. The next question was, can we solve it with Python? So what I needed was a library that actually um, does the job. And I found a library. It's called Abydos or Abydos. Abydos is an a, um, old um, historical name, I think, in Egypt. But I um, didn't research it enough. But it's an old town in Egypt, I think. Um, and this library uh, is... Uh, six years old, basically, but still it's actively maintained. It's from 2014, so it looked uh, pretty pretty solid, and it did the job super well. Um, and solving it with Python meant that, uh, or means that we can reuse our existing code base. So the, there was not much to change, um, but I had to basically optimize some functions because I didn't want to, um, you know, use always the pandas back and forth of parsing and then serializing again. So I uh, replaced some functions there to use native Python types. I come back to this in a moment because it's a bit embarrassing, but <laughs> that's something for later. And you can see here the, the basic um, idea of the pipeline. So reading the data from BigQuery, um, as I said, and then in this um, in encoding of uh, phonetic values, grouping by the values, and then um, grouping all matches by customer number so we know which uh, customer is linked to which customer. Um, then converting it back to BigQuery and writing the result back to BigQuery. So uh, the final pipeline, then, um, you can see here, has uh, the two parts. So what we discussed was the matches for people who share the same address. That's the left arm of the graph here. And the right arm of the graph um, is the people who share the same GA um, visitor ID or basically logged in into um, two, uh, two accounts within the same session. And then uh, in the end, everything is written out into BigQuery. So we have a batch job, as you can see, that runs on data flow, which is basically then executed um, within one hour approximately. So he can uh, process the whole history of or basically the whole customer base and do this analysis uh, within uh, one hour and I think 10 minutes. And that was pretty... Um, yeah, meeting our standards because we only need to run this once a day um, to have an analysis ready. Um, and streaming um, is for later, but I come to that in a moment. Okay, so I hope you made it until here. So you're still interested in are the Olsen twins now the same person or not because we didn't answer the question yet. 
like a secret uh, German agent would say, um, I can't tell you this on record because right now I'm on record. So um, what I can say is we are able to detect linked accounts and duplicated accounts efficiently now. But if you want to find out if they are, you need to contact me privately maybe because again, it's a, it's a secret. What I can tell you is the Beam Python experience is fun. So um, switching from IntelliJ, um, Java IDE, doing Beam Java um, pipeline, pipelines, um, and I was basically used to do everything there, um, profiling code or debugging with IPython debugger or developing with Tmux uh, in a terminal uh, and Vim basically on a Google Cloud Shell machine was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. Uh, because I'm a terminal person. Of course, you can also use PyCharm to do Python stuff, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it in the terminal. <laughs> and the biggest plus was that we could package the pipeline uh, in a folder and then uh, move that because it's pure Python code uh, into our Google Cloud Composer environment, which is Apache Airflow basically in a managed version. So um, then this pipeline was scheduled um, through Airflow to be executed um, on Google Cloud Dataflow once a day. And that was uh, a huge achievement because basically it meant zero uh, maintenance or ops, ops costs for us. I talked about this already, but um, of course, uh, this is um, a price of context switching. So there was a discussion of, okay, now it's in Python, but we have the rest in Java. We have um, Beam Java pipelines running on Flink. Um, we have Python pipelines running on Dataflow. Should we maybe you know, streamline it somehow? Um, and we decided not to because we think it's best to use the world's uh, tools we are in. So for us, the price of context switching uh, is worth it because um, it's much easier, again, to explain um, a data scientist what a 120 lines of code Python file does because it's easy to grasp versus um, compiling it into Java and then having some parts executed there. Um, and it allows us to store it in our Airflow um, repository. So um, it's also easy to pinpoint things and see what has changed for them. So this brings me to our lessons learned. Um, so the knowledge sharing part. Um, we, as I said, use use pandas because the data science word use pandas. And uh, what I found out is that there are already nice transforms available uh, since Beam 2.26.0 uh, to go from a pandas data frame um, to Beam P collection and vice versa. So um, maybe I shouldn't have <laughs> invested some time in doing that myself. But yeah, so you don't have to do that. You can just take what's there. And I encourage you to check out also examples that are now available since 2.30 on GitHub for this kind of actions. Um, running things on Cloud Dataflow is much smoother with experiments uh, dash, uh, dash dash experience equals use runner v2 which should become the default in the future, but sometimes we forgot it and then it was not automatically chosen and then we were debugging it and uh, at some point we noticed, oh, the experiments flag was not set. So just to keep that in mind for now, it's, it's safe for us to just always um, um, use that one um, and it was really a breeze to use it. Um, the last point I want to share is um, you can save costs by uh, running your pipelines if you're not if they're not time sensitive and you don't care if they're running in the next two hours or next three or five hours. You can just uh, pass the flexible resource scheduling goal uh, cost optimized. So then basically the pipeline is being scheduled by Airflow and executed uh, when appropriate. So you save a, a good amount of money by that. And uh, why we uh, didn't implement it in a streaming way yet was because we started doing it with uh, Flink Runner. Um, and the problem was that there are some issues which I have linked in the references, which are being worked on right now for Kafka IO in streaming on Python and with the Flink Runner and the Direct Runner. Um, the reason why we didn't do it with Dataflow was we hadn't had established the connection between Kubernetes Prot our prod cluster of engineering and our um, data flow workers yet. Now this connection is there, so we can also just uh, schedule the job in data flow with Python. 
um, but that's for future work. And with that, I want to conclude the session. <laughs> my session, sorry. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for the um, for the summit and the ability to speak here to you. And I'm looking forward to an awesome Beam Summit uh, of 2021.